NASCAR in 2011 was a breath of fresh air for the sport. Coming off of Jimmy Johnson's unprecedented fifth consecutive championship in 2010, many thought the product had become stale, but the new year brought new life, being regarded as one of the most exciting seasons in recent NASCAR competition. A season that would see five drivers win their first career races, the most in a very long time and easily the most since, the closest championship battle in NASCAR history, and other all-around memorable and crazy events. Because of that, many fans would find a new love for NASCAR in 2011. I personally have lots of nostalgia for this season because it was one of the first I really became invested in watching the majority of the races. But even looking back with an outside perspective, it really was a fantastic year, and I'd love to go over what made 2011 such a special year for NASCAR. There were a few major talking points entering the season, the main one being the change in the point structure, making it so that each position on track was worth one point apiece allowing the winning driver to earn up to 48 points maximum. Compared to the old Winston Cup points system, where a winning driver could earn up to 185 points maximum. Along with this, we would see a change in the chase qualifying procedure, NASCAR's version of the playoffs. I'll go into more detail on this later. There would be another rule change which would affect how drivers could earn points between the three NASCAR National Touring Series. Prior to 2011, all drivers could run all series full-time for points. Starting this year, you would have to announce your eligibility for which series you would be running the championship for. This would affect drivers like Carl Edwards, Kyle Busch, and Brad Keselowski, the 2010 Nationwide Champion, who were all full-time cup drivers in 2010, but elected to run the majority of the 2010 Nationwide season. The NASCAR Nationwide and Truck Series have always been known as developmental series for getting you into the upper levels of NASCAR. With this rule change, NASCAR wanted to discourage full-time Cup Series drivers from running as many of the lower card races. Outside of changes to the championship formats, pit crews would see the removal of the long-time catch can man, as well as the cars would switch to cleaner burning ethanol. Along with those changes, NASCAR would add Kentucky to the Cup Series schedule, the first new track in several years. Now that we've gone over most of the major talking points, let's get into the racing. In the first practice session of the season for the Bud Shootout, the lights would go out on the track, causing a short delay. Here you can see the drivers practicing the two-car tandem. Two-car tandem would become the predominant form of drafting and racing at the super speedways in 2011. This is where two drivers would link up their cars and literally push each other around the track. Before this, drivers would race in packs of cars at Daytona and Talladega. Starting with the Generation 5 Car of Tomorrow in 2007, which saw all manufacturers move to a uniform body style, this would make locking bumpers much easier. We would see some two-car tandem before 2011, but it was mainly only done at the end of races because the driver doing the pushing would overheat quite quickly. Sometime during 2011 preseason testing, though, the drivers began to agree that the two-car tandem was the best form of racing for Daytona and Talladega. Drivers would partner up and take turns pushing each other around the track, keeping themselves out of the chaotic packs caused by the restrictor plates. At the time, many fans, including myself, did not enjoy the two-car tandem style of drafting. However, I've grown to enjoy this style of racing, as role changes at season end would see the return of pack racing at the super speedways in 2012. In 2011, though, two-car tandem was the way to go. Now that that's out of the way, let's move into the actual races. In the Budweiser shootout, Denny Hamlin would pass Ryan Newman and Kurt Busch below the double yellow line, which is a no-no at the restrictor plate races, disqualifying himself and handing the victory to Kurt Busch. Later on that week, Kurt Busch and Jeff Burton would win their respective Gatorade dual qualifying races for the Daytona 500. In the Daytona 500, we would see a record 16 cautions and 74 lead changes between 22 different drivers in the event. Very competitive racing and several incidents, highlighted by the lap 29 big one, would make this an exciting running of the Great American Race. And if you have any interest in motorsports, I really do recommend giving this one a watch. On one of the final restarts, the leader David Reagan would change lanes before the start line, disqualifying himself and handing Trevor Bain the lead. Meanwhile, Robbie Gordon would make a crazy save in turn two before a wreck in the back straightaway would take out Dale Jr. The following restart, Trevor Bain would go on to hold off the rest of the field to win in just his second career Cup Series start at 20 years and one day old to become the youngest Daytona 500 winner ever. 
He would also be the first driver since the inaugural running of the Daytona 500 in 1959 to win in their Daytona 500 debut done by Lee Petty, as well as tie Jamie McMurray's record for least starts before at first Cup Series victory at just two races. The winning team Wood Brothers Racing would earn their first victory since 2001, doing so on a part-time schedule. Trevor Bain would go on to be the first first-time winner of the season in what would be his only career cup victory. Things would get weird for Trevor in the following months, though, where he would go on medical leave for much of the spring for what was rumored to be Lyme disease, but ultimately ended up being symptoms of his then-undiagnosed MS. Following the Daytona 500, NASCAR would move into its yearly West Coast swing. In the second race of the season, Jeff Gordon would lead the most laps at Phoenix, earning himself his 83rd career victory, breaking a 66-race winless streak. This race would be notable for a big accident that would occur on a mid-race restart, as well as being the final race of the old configuration of the racetrack, which would see a mid-season repave. Carl Edwards would win the third race of the year at Las Vegas Motor Speedway. This would be his only win of the season, a stat which would become very important at the end of the year. Kevin Harvick would win in a last lap pass over Jimmy Johnson at Auto Club Speedway in Fontana, California. Kevin Harvick would go on to win again one week later at Martinsville with another late race pass. A few weeks later, another crazy super speedway restrictor plate race at Talladega would see a four-wide finish for the win between Jimmy Johnson, Clint Boyer, Jeff Gordon, and Carl Edwards, tying the closest margin of victory in NASCAR history at just two thousandths of a second. In the Southern 500 at Darlington Raceway, Regan Smith would upset with Furniture Row Racing after taking just two tires in the last pit stop and holding off Carl Edwards for the victory. Although the later years of Furniture Row were very competitive, they would win a championship with Martin Truex Jr. in 2017. The team, which would ultimately close following the 2018 season, had not been super competitive to this point in 2011. At this point in history, Furniture Row had zero top 10s through a handful of part-time seasons and just one previous full-time season. This race would be the team's first ever top 10, top 5, and win. Regan Smith would become the second first-time winner of the year in what would be his only career cup victory. At the Coca-Cola 600 in Charlotte, a late strategy gamble would see several drivers run out of gas on the final restart, including Dale Jr. from the lead on the final lap. This would give Kevin Harvick his third win of the year. Jeff Gordon would win the 5-Hour Energy 500 at Pocono, his 84th career victory. Independence Day weekend would host the Coke Zero 400 at Daytona, where David Reagan would rebound from his Daytona 500 penalty to win. He would be the third first-time winner of the season. Also in this race, Carl Edwards would be involved in an early incident which would knock a crush panel out of place, allowing exhaust fumes to enter the cockpit. Notoriously, he would get sick and vomit in the car, but continue the race and finish 37th, 26 laps down. The following week, the NASCAR Sprint Cup Series would make its first ever trip to Kentucky Speedway, which would see Kyle Busch win. This event was marred by unforeseen traffic issues backing up the nearby freeway and causing about 20,000 ticketed fans to be unable to attend the race. At the Brickyard 400 in Indianapolis, Jeff Gordon would dominate but ultimately lose the lead to a strategy call by the 27 team of Paul Menard. Menard would hold off a hard-charging Jeff Gordon in the final laps on his way to his lone Cup Series victory, making him the fourth first-time winner of the year. Brad Keselowski would win the final 500-mile NASCAR race at Pocono just weeks after breaking one of his ankles, testing for an upcoming road course race. The following weekend in Walkton's Glen, New York, the race would be rain-delayed to Monday. In hindsight, this would be a somewhat interesting occurrence as NASCAR had yet to implement rain tires for their road course events in the Cup Series. Marcus Ambrose would take the lead on a penultimate lap pass from Brad Keselowski. A hard last lap crash would see David Rudiman flip in the S's, bringing out the caution and giving Ambrose his first career win. This would be the first time an Australian-born driver would win a NASCAR Sprint Cup Series race, and Ambrose would become only the fourth foreign-born driver to earn a Cup Series win. This would be the fifth and final time a driver would win their first career race in 2011. Weeks later, Brad Keselowski would win the Bristol Night Race, his third of the year and second while racing injured. Atlanta Motor Speedway would hold its first Labor Day weekend event, but the race would be postponed to Tuesday due to a tropical storm. Jeff Gordon and teammate Jimmy Johnson would battle hard on worn tires in the closing laps, but Gordon would go on to win his third of the season. This would be Gordon's 85th career victory, placing him third on NASCAR's all-time wins list. 
85 wins would also be the most of any driver in NASCAR's modern era starting in 1972. Richmond International Raceway's second race of the season and final of the regular season was marred by cautions and some controversy involving winner Kevin Harvick and his teammates being implicated in what some believed was a strategy to fix the race, not unlike what would happen with Spingate two years later in the same event. The results of this event would set the 12 drivers who would compete for the championship in the chase. Before 2011, the top 12 in points following the first 26 races would compete in the chase. In 2011, the chase qualifying procedure would change, where the top 10 in points would be locked in, while two wild cards with the most wins in points positions 11th through 20th would also qualify. Kyle Busch, Jimmy Johnson, Carl Edwards, Jeff Gordon, Kevin Harvick, Matt Kenseth, Kurt Busch, Ryan Newman, Tony Stewart, and Dale Jr. would lock themselves in the top 10 in points. The two wild cards would be Brad Keselowski and Denny Hamlin. Points would be reset to 2,000 for all chase drivers, and those with wins, excluding the two wildcard drivers, would earn three bonus points for each win they earned in the regular season. Kevin Harvick and Kyle Busch would therefore start the chase with 2,012 points, as each of them had earned four victories up to that point in the year. The results of the final 10 races and the points the chase drivers earned in these races would decide the closest championship battle in NASCAR history. For those who don't know, the non-chase drivers would still race in the chase races with the championship contenders, still allowing for 43 car fields in these races. For coverage of the chase, I will focus on the two best drivers during those 10 races, Carl Edwards and Tony Stewart. The first race of the chase would be at Chicagoland Speedway, and a race ran on Monday after being delayed by rain. Tony Stewart would win this race, his first of the season, after outlasting the rest of the field on fuel, running out shortly after his victory donuts. Following the race, Kevin Harvick would take the chase points lead over Stewart by 7, and Edwards in third by 10. Chase race 2 at New Hampshire Motor Speedway would also come down to fuel mileage, and Stewart would win his second in a row after Clint Boyer ran out of fuel from the lead with just two laps to go. Tony would take the points lead by 7 over Harvick. Carl Edwards would be fourth in points, 14 behind Stewart. The next week, Kurt Busch would win his second race of the season at Dover, holding off a dominant Jimmy Johnson on a late restart. Kevin Harvick and Carl Edwards would tie for the points lead following the event, while Tony Stewart and Kurt Busch would be tied for third, nine points behind them. At Kansas, Jimmy Johnson would dominate once again and hold off Casey Kane to earn his second win of the season. After the race, Carl Edwards would earn the points lead by just one point over Kevin Harvick. Tony Stewart would fall to seventh in the standings, 19 points behind Carl Edwards. The halfway point of the chase would take place in NASCAR's backyard of Charlotte, North Carolina. Matt Kenseth would win. Edwards would extend his points lead over Kevin Harvick to 5, while Stewart would move up to 5th in the standings, but ultimately lose some ground and now face a 24-point deficit. The final restricted plate race of the season would take place at Talladega and once again feature the two-car tandem. This race would see another photo finish where Clint Boyer would slingshot his teammate Jeff Burton in the tri-oval to win. Carl Edwards would again extend his points lead to 14 over Matt Kenseth. Tony Stewart would improve to 4th in the standings, gaining points to only be 19 behind. After leaving the biggest track in NASCAR at Talladega, teams would travel to the shortest in Martinsville, putting on a very exciting short track race which would shake up the points battle for a lot of chasers. Tony Stewart would win his third of the year after a pass of Jimmy Johnson on the final restart. Tony would jump to second in points following the event, just 8 behind Carl Edwards, the points leader. The Friday night before the 8th chase race of 2011 would play host to a truck series event which had drama involving a chase contender and Kyle Busch. Early in that race, Busch and truck series championship contender Ron Hornaday would be battling for the lead going around a lap truck which would cause the two to make contact and bring out the caution. Kyle Busch, known for his temper, would go on to show his displeasure with Hornaday heading into the following corner where he would intentionally spin and crash both of them, virtually ending Hornaday's championship run that year. NASCAR was not amused, though, and would park Bush for the remainder of the race, fine him $50,000, as well as not allow him to compete in the other NASCAR events at the track that weekend, including Sunday's Sprint Cup race, where he would be replaced by Michael McDowell, ending Bush's championship hopes. In the Cup race at Texas, Tony Stewart would go on to win his fourth race of the season, while Carl Edwards would finish second. The victory would help Stewart cut down Edwards' points lead to just three. The penultimate race of the season would take place at a reconfigured Phoenix International Raceway. Tony Stewart would lead the most laps but finish third, while Edwards would take second place. Casey Kane would win for Red Bull Racing in what would be the team's second-to-last race as they would close their doors at season's end. 
Heading into the final race of the year at Homestead, Miami, Carl Edwards would hold a three-point lead over Tony Stewart. They would be the only two still in contention for the championship. Tony would not have a very impressive practice or qualifying and would start 15th. Meanwhile, Carl Edwards was very fast, winning the pole position and looked to be the race favorite. To start the race, Carl Edwards would take the early lead, earning himself an important bonus point, while Stewart would get some grill damage that he'd be forced to repair, sending him back to 40th place. Stewart would work his way back into the top 5 by the time a rain delay would stop the race at lap 109. After about an hour delay, the ensuing restart would line up the two title contenders side by side in 3rd and 4th. Stewart would lead a few laps, earning himself a valuable bonus point as well. The two would battle throughout the top 10 before Edwards would retake the lead and earn himself the bonus point for the most laps led. A strategy call would see Stewart pitting for four tires and fuel 10 laps later than Edwards would in hopes of it being his final stop of the race. Edwards would retake the lead, but another caution for rain allowed him to pit for two tires and also give him enough fuel to finish the event. After the rain delay, Tony Stewart would restart third and take the lead in just a lap. Soon after, Carl Edwards would move into second. Edwards would try as hard as he could, but he just could not get by Stewart and his fresher left side tires, allowing Stewart to go on to his fifth victory of the season. After the 36 NASCAR Sprint Cup Series races were completed that season, we would see a first for NASCAR, a tie in the final point standings. Both Carl Edwards and Tony Stewart had accrued 2,403 points that year, but a champion had yet to be determined. The tiebreaker would go to the driver with the most wins between the two, which was Tony, who despite not winning any of the first 26 races, would go on to win half of the 10 chase races that season, compared to Carl Edwards' lone victory in the third race of the year at Las Vegas in March. This would be Tony's third and final NASCAR championship. Tony would start racing for the team he co-owned with Gene Haas in 2009, making him the first owner-driver champion since Alan Kowicki in 1992. There would be a few other interesting events that would occur throughout the course of the year. In February, Michael Waltrip won the truck race at Daytona on the 10-year anniversary of his first Daytona 500 win. The same Daytona 500, which would tragically see Dale Earnhardt, his then-car owner, die in a last-lap accident. In June, the Nationwide Series raced at Road America for the second ever time. The event would go almost 30 miles over its scheduled distance as it took three green-white checkered overtime attempts to complete. Michael McDowell would run out of fuel from the lead on the first green-white checkered attempt, handing the race lead to Justin Allgaier. After a yellow, Allgaier would restart up front and hold the lead over Reed Sorensen on the final two restart attempts before a caution would come out on the last lap. As the leaders were slowing down for the yellow, Ron Fellows would pass Sorensen for second. Before completing the final lap, Allgaier would run out of fuel from the lead and Fellows would seemingly take the checkered flag. After a 10 minute delay, NASCAR ruled that Fellows had passed Sorensen under the caution flag illegally and handed the win to Sorensen. In August, another nationwide series race would end in bizarre fashion as leader Ricky Stenhouse Jr. would blow his motor just a few hundred yards before the finish line. His teammate Carl Edwards, running close behind, would get caught up in his smoke and oil and crash into him across the finish line. Stenhouse would win. At season's end, Ricky Stenhouse Jr. would win his first of two consecutive Nationwide Series championships by 45 points over Elliott Sadler. After winning Rookie of the Year for the Truck Series in 2010, Austin Dillon would win his first NASCAR National Series championship by just six points over Johnny Sauter. Timmy Hill would win Nationwide Series Rookie of the Year after missing the opening race at Daytona because he was not yet 18, but would run the rest of the races that season and become the then youngest ever Rookie of the Year winner. Sports car driver Andy Laley would win Cup Series Rookie of the Year in an uneventful battle as he'd be the only rookie to complete the minimum amount of races, despite being fired from the team before season's end. Older Bush brother Kurt would have a verbal altercation with a media member placing him on probation by NASCAR until the end of the year, which would partially be the reason he would end his longtime deal with Penske Racing at season's end. Finally, NASCAR would make its last trip to Nashville Super Speedway. But as of the recording of this video, NASCAR just announced their return to the venue and its addition to the Cup Series schedule for the first time in 2021. And that is my retrospective of NASCAR in 2011. Now I did not come close to covering every event this year, but I did highlight the majority of the headlines from the season. 2011 was a great year to be a NASCAR fan, and if you're a fan yourself, I highly recommend going back and taking some time to really enjoy what made this season so great. If you want to see the best motorsports has to offer, 2011 definitely made an interesting case for why it should be considered one of the all-time best seasons in motorsports. If you'd like to see me look back at past racing seasons or individual races all across motorsports, I'd be happy to oblige. 
Thanks for watching, and don't forget to wax your bumper.